Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 17. In this lecture we will see theoretical constructions of block ciphers, specifically the roadmap for this lecture is as follows. So, till last lecture we have seen that if we have a pseudo random function then we can design candidate CPA secure schemes using modes of operations of pseudo random functions. But now the question is how do we actually go about designing the pseudo random function and it turns out that there are two ways of designing pseudo random functions. The first phase the first class of the constructions are the provably secure constructions which we are going to discuss here and they are considered to be theoretical constructions because that is not the way we instantiate pseudo random functions in the real world protocols. In the later lectures we will see in the practical constructions namely the constructions which we use in real world to instantiate pseudo random function. However, even though we do not use the theoret so called theoretical instantiations of pseudo random functions they are very fundamental they are of fundamental importance in cryptography because uh, mathematically here we show that the constructions that we are going to discuss they can be proved to be secure based on the assumption that one way function exists. That means, we have now mathematical guarantees that the constructions that we are going to see in this lecture they are secure. Whereas, the so called practical instantiations right which we are going to see in the subsequent lectures for those constructions we do not have any provable security guarantees. That means, there is no mathematical proof that indeed those constructions satisfies the definitions of pseudo random functions, pseudo random permutations and so on. It is only an belief or an assumption that ever since their discovery no attacks or no shortcomings have been reported in those constructions and that is why we believe that those constructions emulates the behavior of a pseudo random function, pseudo random permutations and so on. Right? So, now coming back to this lecture the roadmap for this lecture is as follows. We will see how to construct provably secure pseudo random functions given provably secure pseudo random generators. Then we will see the constructions of provably secure pseudo random permutations from probably secure provably secure pseudo random function and this construction is also called as Luby Rakoff construction attributed to the name of their inverters. And then finally, we will see how to construct provably secure strong pseudo random permutations given provably secure pseudo random permutation. So, let us do the first thing here namely we will see how if you are given a provably secure pseudo random generator we will see how to construct provably secure pseudo random permutation. And for the purpose of demonstration I am assuming that I have a length doubling pseudo random generator and this you can construct in a provably secure way from one way function using the Goldreich Levin construction and assuming that hardcore predicate exist right. So, remember in one of our earlier lectures we had seen provably secure constructions of pseudo random generator where we first expand the output or, or the input of the pseudo random generator by one bit using hardcore predicate and then we do a serial composition of that pseudo random generator polynomial number of times to in expand the length of the pseudo random generator by any polynomial amount. So, I assume that I have such a pseudo random generator namely a length doubling pseudo random generator and my goal is basically to construct a pseudo random function taking n bit key n bit block and giving me a 2 n bit output right. And the construction is called a tree construction and the reason it is called a tree construction is that basically the way we define the keyed function f k is that we construct a complete binary tree of depth n consisting of 2 to the power n leaf nodes where each leaf node is going to consist of pseudo random string of length 2 n bits determined by the value of the underlying key k right. Now, the reason we are going to construct a complete binary tree of depth n is that we are going to have 2 to the power n leaves and each leaf node is basically a value of the function f k and this matches with our semantic of the keyed function f k that we are interested to construct because the block size of my underlying keyed function which I want to construct is n bits. That means, my function f k namely the range of this little i could range from 0 to 2 to the power n minus 1. So, there there are 2 to the power n candidate inputs for this function that is why I am interested to design a tree consisting of 2 to the power n nodes. And the ith value or the value of the keyed function f k on the input i will be basically the pseudo random stream string which I am going to store at the ith leaf node in this tree. 
So, the entire thing boils down that how exactly this tree is going to be defined as a function of my underlying key k, right. So, for the purpose of demonstration I assume that I have a pseudo random generator expanding a seed of length 3 bits into an output of 6 bits and using that I have to design a keyed pseudo random function taking a key input of size 3 bits, a block input of size 3 bits and giving me a pseudo random output of 6 bits. And the construction is as follows, so this is your complete binary tree of 8 nodes. So, this is your 0th leaf, this is your 1st leaf and this like this, this is your 7th leaf and this will denote the, the strings that we are going to store in each of this respective leaf nodes will denote the value of the function f which we are going to define at their respective inputs. So, now let us see what exactly will be the bit strings which are going to be stored in each of this internal nodes and the leaf nodes. So, to begin with at the root of the tree we are going to store the value k0, k1 which is a bit string of length 6 bits and which is generated by actually invoking the pseudo random generator on the key k, right. So, remember k is basically the key of the pseudo random function which I am interested to design, but now that key I am using as the seed for the pseudo random generator and since my pseudo random generator expands the seed and gives me an output which is twice the size of the input, I will obtain a pseudo random output which can I can parse as 2 blocks of 3 bits 3 bits each, right. Now, in my left hand side node right which is that means the left child of this root I basically store the output of the pseudo random generator on the input k0 right. So, remember the string k0 k1 is a string of length 3 bits. So, you have 3 bits here you have 3 bits here the first 3 bits part I am denoting as k0 and I call the function g on that input to again obtain a new pseudo random string of length 6 bits which again I can divide into 2 parts. And the right child of my node uh, root basically stores the value of the output of the pseudo random generator on the string k1, which will now give me another pseudo random string of length 6 bits, which I can parse as 2 chunks of 3 bits, 3 bits each. And then I repeat this process at the first layer of this tree, right. That means this node will now have the outcome of the pseudo random generator on the 3 bits k 0 0 as the input and this node will have the output of the pseudo random generator on the seat k 0 comma 1 and again I obtain an output of 6 bits and so on. So, that is the way the internal nodes are filled and similarly I fill the leaf nodes also using the same logic here. Now, how exactly I am going to output f k of i right. So, imagine so, this is the this whole tree is basically the definition of f k. Now, I have to define what exactly will be the output of this tree on my input i. So, remember the keyed function f takes two inputs the key input and the actual block input. So, with respect to the key input I have defined the tree to be like this. Now, I have to define how I take the output of this tree for the input i right. So, imagine for instance I want to dis define or compute the value of this so called function f k at the input 3. So, 3 in binary can be written as 0 1 1 and basically the idea is now I have to just pass this tree based on the binary representation of 3 right. So, I pass the first bit here which is 0 if it is 0 the rule is I go to the left of my current node. So, I start exploring from the root first bit is 0 I go to the left node the next bit in the binary representation of 3 is 1. So, from my current node I go to the right and the last bit in the binary representation of 3 is a 1. So, that means from my current node I go to the right and this will be the value of my function f k at the input 3 that is the way I am going to define my function f k. So, if you see on a very high level basically the way function f k is defined it is nothing but a uh, polynomial number of sequential composition of the truly random generator right. I am basically composing the pseudo random generator g polynomial number of times depending upon the binary representation of my input i 
in this case the binary representation was 0 1 1. So, I am basically invoking the function g 3 times in sequence one after the other where the outcome of the previous invocation of g is serving as the input for the next invocation in a specific way depending upon the binary representation of my input i. That is the way you can internally interpret the execution or the construction of this keyed function f k. Now, you might be wondering that whether this construction is efficient or not because the size of the tree is exponentially large here right. It consists of 2 to the power n number of nodes and where n is the security parameter. So, that means if I am dis defining the function f k like this then one might feel that both sender and the receiver have to maintain this tree because once they know the value of the k they have to construct the tree like that because they do not know well in advance what is the value of the i that they are going to use. It could be end up with any of the leaf nodes right. So, they have to have the whole tree with them in advance, but storing the whole tree will require them exponential amount of computation. So, intuitively this construction might look like to be an inefficient construction, but it turns out that the entire tree need not be computed and stored to compute the value of this keyed function on the input i because depending upon the requirement that means depending upon the value of i, I can compute or I can compute I can compute the actual path that I need to follow in this tree by just invoking my underlying pseudo random generator n number of times. For instance, if I want to compute the value of the function f k i at i equal to 3, what I basically need is just 3 invocations of the p r g that is all. I do not need the remaining invocations of the PRG. In the same way suppose later I am interested in computing the value of say f k 4, where 4 in the binary representation is 1 0 0, then I do not need the whole tree. I need only this node namely this invocations of the PRG followed by this invocation of the PRG followed by this invocation of the PRG. That means, each value of f k i can be just computed by compu executing polynomial number of instances of the underlying pseudo random generator and that is why this construction is computationally efficient. It is not it does not demand exponential amount of computation. Now, the big question is this construction is this tree construction or this this way of defining the pseudo random function of defining the keyed function f k is indeed going to give me a secure p r f. And the answer is yes, because intuitively what is f k i? What is the way I have computed f k i? f k i you can interpret as a polynomial number of sequential compositions of p r g. And remember when we were discussing pseudo random generator earlier, we had proved rigorously that polynomial number of sequential composition of p r g also gives you a, a pseudo random generator. Namely that output will be pseudo random and it will be indistinguishable from the outcome of a corresponding truly random generator. So, in that sense this way of defining the function f k based on a complete binary tree is indeed going to define a pseudo random function. But now if I want to formalize this intuition into a rigorous proof then there are a lot of subtleties which are involved here right. So, the actual proof is indeed subtle and it requires lot of advanced technicalities. So, due to the interest of time and since the proof is really out of scope of this course, I will avoid the full complete uh, full formal details of the proof. But if you are really interested to see the complete proof, you can see the proof available in the book by Katz and Rendell and also in the manuscript by Bonnet et al. But let me discuss the overall proof idea right. So, as I said the value of the f k i is nothing but polynomial number of invocations of the pseudo random generator. So, my goal is basically to show that if an adversary interacts with the keyed function f k by asking polynomial number of queries where it does not know the value of k. It knows the structure of the tree, but it does not know the value of the k and hence it does not know what are the pseudo random streams which are gender stored in the individual nodes. So, imagine if I have an adversary which is in interacting with f k i or a function f k polynomial number of times my goal is to show that it should not be able to distinguish the behavior of this tree construction from the behavior of a truly random function. But I cannot directly reduce that indistinguishability to the security of the underlying security of the pseudo random generator because there are polynomial number of invocations of the pseudo random generator which are involved here. So, what basically we require here is the hybrid argument. 
So, let us see the security of the tree construction basically we, we have a, a overview of the proof idea here and for the demonstration of the proof idea I take the case where I am constructing a pseudo random function taking a key of size 3 bits and giving you an output of size uh, sorry it takes an input of size 3 bits and gives you an output of 6 bits and it has it is operated by a key and this is designed using a pseudo random generator uh, which takes a seed of length 3 bits and it gives you an output of 6 bits. So, as per the tree construction that we have discussed just now this is how your the function f k will look like and now what I am going to do is I will I am going to compare this tree, uh, tree based uh, so construction of the function f k with another alter with alternative construction with an alternate construction uh, where all the instances all the instances of the pseudo random generator big G are going to be replaced by a truly random generator G prime. <coughs> so, what we are basically trying to construct here is we are trying to construct an unkeyed truly random function which takes an input of size 3 bits and it gives you an output of 6 bits. And on a very high level the construction is exactly the same as the tree construction except that at each node all the invocations of your function G are replaced by G prime. So, at root node we we just call the function g prime and since a function since the uh, function g prime uh, is a true random generator it does not take any input. So, it just gives you some random 6 bit output that will be filled in this route. Then when we go to the left node again we invoke the function g prime which will give you another 6 bit random truly random string and like that you can see that each node we are basically just invoking my function g prime and as a result each of these nodes in this tree which is constructed on the right hand side part will have true random values of length 6 bits. So, that is how we have constructed the function little f right. So, <coughs> now construction wise uh, the difference between the two functions that we have constructed is that if we want to uh, the left hand side tree it defines your function f k and if I want to compute the value of this function at some input i say for instance if I want to find the value of this function on your left hand side on the input i equal to say all zeros, then basically I have to follow the path 0 0 0 and the value of my f k of i will be the value stored here. On the same other hand if I want to compute the value of the function little f that I have constructed in the right hand side on the input all zeros, then again I have to follow as the for I have to traverse along this tree as per the binary representation of my input i and wherever I stop the leaf node the value that is stored there that will be considered as the value of the function little f on the input i. So, in terms of the way I am computing the uh, obtaining the output of the function it remains the same in both the function what differs in the two functions is then the left hand side tree all the invocations are for pseudo random generator and in the right hand side tree all the invocations are for true random number generator. Now informally the proof idea here is the security the idea behind the security of the tree construction that we have given is that if the underlying function big G is a secure PRG then what we are going to show is in the proof that no polynomial time distinguisher should be able to distinguish apart the value of the function f k on the input i from the value of the function little f on the input i. That means, it does not matter whether he has interacted with the tree construction on the left hand side polynomial number of time or whether he ha it has interacted with the tree on the right hand side polynomial number of tree from the viewpoint of the adversary the interaction should be almost identical except with negligible probability if indeed my function big G is a secure PRG. So, that is what is basically the overall idea of the proof that is what I have to show and the idea behind the proof here is we basically define n plus 1 complete binary tree each of depth n where each node is going to uh, store 2 n bit strings, but in a different way right. So, let us start with the tree T 0 which is actually a tree of length uh, of depth n complete binary tree of depth n where each of the nodes basically consist of a uniformly random 2 n bit string. And this is nothing but the way a truly random function little f will behave as per the tree construction. And my ith tree tree i 
will be as follows. In my ith tree T i, the first n minus i levels, all the nodes in those n minus i levels will consist of 2 n bit uniformly random strings, whereas all the remaining levels will consist of pseudo random strings by applying the tree mechanism or the tree construction to the node at the previous level. If I go to the i plus 1th tree, the way it differs from the ith tree is that it will have one layer less of pseudo random strings and one layer more of pseudo random strings compared to the previous tree, right. That means in the i plus 1th tree, the first n minus i minus 1 layers of node will consist of uniformly random strings of length 2 n bits and the remaining layers of node will consist of pseudo random strings of 2 n bits by applying the pseudo random generator g on the previous level and so on. And like this if I continue my n plus 1 th tree T n basically is the way I have defined the function f k that means all the nodes consist of pseudo random strings of length 2 n bits by applying the pseudo random generator g to the value of the tree nodes at the previous level. So, that is the way I have defined n plus 1 trees and each of these trees basically defines a construction of a function mapping n bit strings to n bit outputs a uh, 2 n bit outputs right. So, the first tree basically defines the way a truly random function will operate and the last tree defines the way we have constructed the keyed function f k. And the overall idea behind the security proof of the tree construction is that we will prove that we can prove that formally if my underlying g is a secure PRG then the behavior of the function defined by the tree ti and the behavior of the function defined by the tree ti plus 1 are computationally indistinguishable from the viewpoint of an attacker who makes polynomial number of queries to the function defined by the tree ti or make polynomial number of queries to the tree defined by for to the function defined by the tree ti plus 1 right and this argument we can reduce by giving a reduction based argument and we can show that if and all there is an adversary who can distinguish apart the behavior of the function f i from the function f i plus 1, then it knows how to distinguish apart the behavior of a truly random generator from a pseudo random generator, right. That is the overall idea. So, since there are polynomial number of intermediate hybrids in between my truly random function f and my function f k which I have defined. I can say that the overall the probability with which an adversary can distinguish apart the behavior of the function little f from the behavior of the function f k is the summation of polynomial number of negligible quantities which is again a negligible quantity. That is the overall idea of the security proof, but the actual formal details are really involved and subtle and that is why due to the interest of the time I am skipping it. So, now we will see that if we are given a pseudo random function, how we go about to construct a pseudo random permutation by a very interesting primitive which we call as Fistel network. And this is a very powerful cryptographic uh, primitive or construction right, which we again encounter when we will see the practical instantiations of pseudo random permutations namely when we will discuss about the construction of DES right. So, the basic idea here is the uh, basic idea behind a fistel network is that it gives you a method of converting invertible function from arbitrary collection of several functions which need not be invertible, right. So, what exactly that means? So, for demonstration purpose assume you are given two arbitrary functions f1 and f2 mapping n bit strings to n bit strings which need not be invertible. That is why I am saying they could be any arbitrary function and my goal is to use this two arbitrary functions f1 and f2 and define a new function mapping say 2 n bit strings to 2 n bit strings such that the resultant function is invertible. So, that resultant function I call or denote as fistel subscript f1 f2 because I am composing the two arbitrary functions little f1 little f2 in a specific way which we will see soon to obtain an invertible function. So, here is how the composed function fistel f1 f2 will work or look like. So, it will take an input of size 2 n bits and it has to produce an output of size 2 n bits by somehow composing the functions little f1 and little f2. So, what we are going to do here is we will parse the input x as 
2 chunks of n bits n bits each and the overall construction will be interpreted as a sequence of 2 rounds. So, in round 1 I am going to construct or convert this input x into an intermediate output which again I will parse as 2 parts which I call as the left half and the right half right and the way this L1 and R1 is computed from L0 and R0 is as follows. The L1 part is basically set to be the same as the R0 part right and the R1 part is computed by invoking the function little f1 on the input R0 and XORing the output with L0 part. So, since my function f1 takes an n bit input and my R0 part is also an n bit input that is fine and the output of the function f1 is again n bits which can be XORed with an L0 part which is of n bits to give me an output R1 which is of n bits. So, that is the rule or uh, that is the way I am going to use my function f1 for the first round. Now, once I obtain the intermediate output denoted as concatenated of concatenation of L1 part and R1 part, I do the same principle, but now in the second round I am going to use the second function and that is why this is a two round construction. So, in the second round again my R1 part is set as L2 and my R2 is computed by invoking now the second function F2 on the input R1 and XORing it with L1 and obtaining R2. That is the way the function fistal F1 F2 will look like. So, in general if you are given R arbitrary functions which I denoted which I denote as little f1, little f2, little fr mapping n bit strings to n bit strings then I compose then I can compose it by applying this logic which we had seen in the previous example sequentially r time and what I obtain is a function which I denote as fistal function consisting of r individual function composed in sequence mapping 2 n bit strings to 2 n bit strings. So, the idea behind is that I apply the same logic that we had seen in the last example r times where in the ith round I apply the ith round function namely little f i. Now, you might be wondering whether the resultant function fistal composing composed of r invocation comp, composed uh, which consists of basically sequence of r compose uh, r uh, little functions is in indeed going to give you an invertible function or not. So, I claim that it does not matter what exactly is the choice of your underlying functions f1, f2, fr that means it does not matter what exactly are your round functions. So, I call this individual functions which I am applying in the individual round as the round function. So, the claim that we are going to make is it does not matter what exactly is your what exactly are your round functions they need not be invertible it could be any arbitrary functions. The way we compose the, the way we are composing this r individual functions the resultant function is always going to give you invertible functions irrespective of how many times you do it. And the idea behind the proof is the effect of every round can be uniquely uh, the, the idea behind is the idea behind the proof of this claim is that the effect of each round is invertible in dip, irrespective of how ex, what exactly is your round function. So, for instance let us see that whether we can in reverse back the effect of the rth round function that means imagine you are given the output of this fistal function namely you are given lr concatenated with rr and the question is can I uniquely go back to the previous intermediate output given that I know the rth round function and it turns out we can do that. How? Well, by the description or by the nature the way we have done the composition we know that the previous intermediate right half is nothing but the current left half right. So, I can always go back from uh, the current right half to the previous right half by this rule and I know that the previous left half is nothing but the XOR of the previous uh, I, I know that the current right half is basically the XOR of the previous left half and the output of the rth round function on the previous right half. So, if at all I want to recover the previous left half what I have to do is basically I have to evaluate the current round function in this example the rth round function right on the previous right half which I have already recovered and XOR it with the current right half that will give me back the previous left half 
that is the way I can uniquely go back from my current state to the previous state. And then I can repeat this argument and go back one level up, again I can repeat this argument and can, can go back one level up and all the way I can go back to the input L0 and R0. That means it does not matter what exactly is the type of the individual round functions, the way we have actually composed these functions given the final outcome of the composed function I can always uniquely go back to the actual input. And in that sense this function the composed function is an invertible function. So, now let us see how we go about constructing pseudo random permutation given that we have a provably secure pseudo random function. Right. So, I am assuming that I have a construction of a provably secure pseudo random function for simplicity I assume that a key length, block length and output length are all n bit strings. And I am going to use a 3 round Fistel network that means I will be now applying 3 round functions and I will end up obtaining a keyed permutation where the length of the key will be 3 n bit strings and the block length will be 2 n bits and the output will be 2 n bits and the keyed function which is which I denote as S superscript 3 can be proved to be a keyed permutation. Right? So, since the key is going to be of length 3, 3 n bits I can interpret it as 3 chunks of or 3 independent chunks of n bits n bits n bits and I am going to apply the Fistel network 3 times or basically I am going to apply the 3 round Fistel network which basically means I have to compose 3 round functions. Now, basically in each of the rounds I am going to invoke the underlying pseudo random function with independent keys. right? So, the way I am going to define my keyed permutation is nothing but the composed Fistel network where the first round function is the keyed pseudo random function on the first n bits of the key of my pseudo random permutation. The second round function is going to be f k 2 namely my invocation of pseudo random function with k 2 part of the key. And the third round function will be f k 3 namely the invocation of the pseudo random function with the last n bits of the key. That is the way I am going to compose the pseudo random function 3 times using the structure of the Fistel network. Right? So, that is that is the way I have defined. So, my first round function is f k 1 and by applying f k 1 as my first round function I go from L 0 R 0 to L 1 R 1. Given L 1 R 1 I apply f k 2 as or treat f k 2 as my second round function and go from L 1 R 1 to L 2 R 2. And finally, by applying f k 3 on the input L 2 R 2 I obtain L 3 R 3 and that is what will be the outcome of the function f 3 under the key k 1 k 2 k 3 on the input L 0 concatenated R 0. That is the way I am going to define a keyed permutation. Right? So, it is easy to see that a resultant composed Fistel function is indeed an invertible function we had already proved that. Right? What is left is to show that why this magical 3 round construction is going to give me a pseudo random permutation that means why this keyed permutation is indistinguishable from the behavior of a truly random permutation. Well, again the proof is slightly involved and I leave the complete details due to the lack of the time. Uh, you are you are referred to the book by Kart Slendel for the actual proof, but you have to believe me that if I compose this pseudo random function 3 times with the independent keys as per the structure of the Fistel network then the resultant construction is indeed a keyed permutation. Now, an important point here is why not 2 rounds, why we have to compose this uh, Fistel network 3 times, why we, why we require 3 is why not 2 rounds. It turns out that if I use a key of size only say 2 n bits and I apply only 2 round functions then the resultant key permutation is not pseudo random. It can be easily distinguishable, it is easily distinguishable from a corresponding truly random permutation and that is why it is only when we compose 3 times we actually get a pseudo random permutation. So, this is left as an assignment for you, you have to now think that why exactly 2 rounds are not sufficient why 3 rounds. Now, let us finally, see that uh, how do we go about constructing strong pseudo random permutations from a pseudo random function. So, before that let us first see what exactly is the difference between a pseudo random permutation or keyed pseudo random permutation and a keyed strong pseudo random permutation. right? So, if I consider pseudo random permutation which is a keyed function permutation mapping say 
2 n bit strings to 2 n bit strings when I say it is a pseudo random permutation then it means that no polynomial time distinguisher can distinguish apart an interaction with this keyed permutation from an unkeyed truly random permutation. But if I say that I have a strong pseudo random permutation then it is a special type of keyed permutation which should be indistinguishable from a corresponding truly random permutation even if my distinguisher gets access to not only the inputs of the outputs of the permutation but also to the inverse of the permutations that means the keyed permutation should be indistinguishable even if the interaction if, even if the adversary is getting interaction or oracle access to the function fk as well as the inverse of the function right so imagine we are given a provably secure pseudo random function which we know how to construct using the tree construction it turns out that if we do a four round fistel network namely if we use four round functions and compose it as per the structure of the fistel network then we end up getting a keyed strong pseudo random permutation mapping 4 n bit strings and blocks of size 2 n bits to an output of size 2 n bits okay and again the proof is slightly involved which i am leaving due to the interest of the time you are referred to the book by cards lindel right so that's the overall idea here so now if we see uh, if you look into the assumptions that we require for provably secure symmetric cryptography the picture till now is as follows. We know that if we are given one way functions then using the goldrick Levin theorem and hardcore predicate we get provably secure pseudo random generator and in this lecture we had seen that from pseudo random generator we can construct provably secure pseudo random function using which we can construct provably secure pseudo random permutation and then it can be further used to construct provably secure strong pseudo random permutation. And we also know that how we can construct efficient CPS secure encryption scheme from PRFs by using modes of operation. Later in this course we are going to see that how we can in fact construct more powerful uh, symmetric encryption process namely authenticated encryption and CCA secure encryption just using pseudo random functions. So, it turns out that everything just depends upon the existence of one way functions that means if you want provably secure constructions of uh, provably secure CPS secure encryption scheme, provably secure C CCS scheme, provably secure authenticated encryption scheme then it suffice to just have one way function. That means it is enough you have just one way function you can get everything for free and later on in this course when we will discuss public key cryptography we will see that how exactly we can go about and construct one way functions based on specific number theoretic hardware assumptions right. So, everything boils down to the existence of one way functions. So, that brings me to the end of this lecture just to summarize in this lecture we had seen very high level overview of how do we give provably secure constructions of pseudo random function, pseudo random permutation and strong pseudo random permutation. Thank you.